All right, we're here with Lee J. Berman, uh, one of my mediation mentors and one of the great uh, thinkers I think about uh, when I think about mediation. He's with the American Institute of Mediation based in California, and we're very thankful to have him today. Uh, we were talking, and a lot of the things that we see about mediation now in the age of COVID, uh, there's a lot of talk about the mechanics of how to do online mediations and that's, that's really good. And I was reminded though of a presentation that Lee J gave to the Dallas Bar Association a while back, where he talked about sort of the soft underbelly and talked about sort of the humanness of things in mediation. And it got me to thinking about how do we really develop that in a line of the online sphere. And so Lee J, I've got a couple of questions for you if it's all right. Um, one of the things that you've talked about in your trainings before is about the importance of first impressions. How do we go about doing first impressions by Zoom or some other online service? Um, that's different than meeting people in a conference room and being able to shake their hand and you know welcome them in and that type of thing. How do we handle first impressions? A great question. And first, Gene, let me just say thank you for all the kind words and thanks for asking me to do this with you. I'm flattered and, and looking forward to the conversation. Um, so to me, and I'm going to get deep right off the bat here, first impressions to me are two different things. One is what we want to project to others and what we want them to know about us. Um, but the more important part, I think, is us absorbing from them and them feeling seen and heard by us. And like you say, when we walk out into a lobby or somebody walks into our conference room and we get to approach them and shake their hand and see how they're dressed and we can convey with body language um, that we're comfortable and easy and they can feel safe talking to us and that we're interested in them and, and our genuineness, all of that. So I think it, it, it's different in this way when we're using Zoom or Skype or, or GoToMeeting or some other service because obviously we, we're, we're only seeing each other from you know the second button of our shirts up, right? Um, and, and so we're missing all the rest of the body language and it's harder to read people. And so what that means, I think, is we have to, uh, the part that's hardest for me is, I think it's really important that we meet people where they're at and then figure out where we wanna go with them from there. I, I think some mediators fail in person by being, hi, I'm your jazzy, everything's gonna be great today, mediator, and people look at that person and say, they don't understand the severity of what I'm going through right now if, it's, if, if I'm the party in the mediation. And I think matching the energy that people bring in the room and connecting to them where they are, which in mediations is normally nervous, uh, a little scared about what's gonna happen, um, if they're one-time users of our system, if they're you know, plaintiffs in an employment or a PI case or something, for example, they don't know what's about to happen or what they should do and who they should trust. So we've got to be right there with them where they are in that space. And I think that becomes even more important multiplied when we're just dealing with these two dimensions sort of that we have here on a flat screen. And I think we've got to work harder to see where people are, like I'm looking at you right now and the look on your face, the expression is very serious and thoughtful. So if I come to you too far from that space, I'm not gonna connect with you. We're gonna be too far apart. Um, I, I'll give you my easy scale. I think of it as a continuum from one to 10. And I feel like people who hang out around an eight and are really positive and bubbly and they're great to be around if you're in the mood for that, but if we all have a certain zone that we can cover, those people who are an eight, they can certainly stretch up and connect to people who are at a 10 energetically, and, and they can probably get down to somebody who's a five on the other side of, of their eight. But if you have somebody who's introverted and quiet or scared and withdrawn, and is maybe a two or a three on that scale of, of um, extrovertedness uh, or, or energy, I think the person who enters at an eight has trouble doing that. So what I find is on video conferencing like this, I try and come in neutral like a five and immediately gravitate to what I think I see from the people. Um, and right now it's you and me, we're one-on-one. -on -one. I, can, I can see that in you. If I have you know nine people on the screen because it's a bigger mediation, that's a little harder to do. And in that moment, 
I'm trying to convey more confidence and that they can trust me. And so I come maybe with more gravitas so that I can be a centering force for all nine of them that are spread all over the spectrum. I'm a long answer, Gene, but I hope it, it helps make some sense. You know, it really does. And, and you said something that I had thought about, but you really put it into the words. It, on this video conferencing and in Zoom-based mediations, we see each other from two buttons up. Yeah. And we don't get to see a lot of the other body language that we're used to in person. I mean, like, you know, I'm doing my hands right now, but, you know, you can't tell what I'm really doing. And so it really forces us to pay attention to people's faces and their expressions. And that can really be hard to do, like I said, on a big mediation where there's not just two people, but a lot of very small spaces. And, you know, how do you see someone like that? You know, it really makes it complicated, I think. It does. It does. And the other is voice. I, I'm I, in some of the other non-mediation work that I do. I spend a lot of time on the phone with people and I have for 15 years. And so I've gotten really used to listening for the spaces in between their words and the places where they go to take a breath and they stutter breathe because they're nervous or you've asked them something that, that makes them shift in their chair and on the screen you can see them go, hmm. And, and those are the kinds of things that I've, I'm working really hard to connect to in two dimensions. Uh, there's actually been some writing about how Zoom mediations or Zoom meetings can lead to some element of burnout. And a lot of our mediator colleagues have been saying at the end of a day, doing eight hours on a Zoom mediation instead of in person, they're more exhausted. Um, and I think part of it's because we're working so hard exercising muscles, we don't always use as much to try and gather what we can from just this little uh, headshot, this bust that we have to work with. I've seen a lot of that about, uh, about that too, and I'd like to get your thoughts on it because you know, most mediations I'm in, I'm exhausted at the end of it. Because, you know, I think a good media really pours themselves into the mediation. You've got to pay so, so much careful attention to so many little things. And um, it looks easy, but it's really, really hard. Listening is really, really hard. And so for what advice, I guess, would you give to those mediators that, that say, you know, I'm just, I'm just exhausted at the end of the Zoom meeting, Zoom mediation. How can we help with the exhaustion levels? So that maybe we're not so exhausted during the meeting um, or during the mediation and really are able to give our full attention to people and the matters that they're bringing to us. So I think there are two things. Um, the first is really just practice, like going to the gym and working on your muscles. Uh, like I said, we're, we're using muscles we haven't used before. We've got to get more comfortable doing this. That's going to come with time. It's going to come with hours in the chair. Uh, just like when we first started as mediators and we had to get comfortable with, with hours in the chair. But the second is, if you're finding yourself exhausted at the end of a long mediation, exhaustion often comes from trying. I'm trying to listen. I'm trying to be empathetic. I'm trying to be creative. I'm trying to, to bring them to a point of decision, you know, all those sorts of things. If we're trying too hard in the sense of neutrality, it might mean that we're trying to push folks to something where we're doing all the heavy lifting. And this is a place where a shift in mediation style might actually make sense. And I'm not gonna get into the whole debate about evaluative and, and, and facilitative and transformative, but I will say that if you're exhausted, you're probably the one who's having to figure out what question to ask next, and you've got this heavy burden on your shoulders of running the process. And I think the, the way to lighten your own load is to give yourself permission to say to the parties, oh, what do you all think we should do next? Or what question would you ask next if you were me? I'm kind of stumped. And those sorts of things that can be, um, that can demonstrate a little vulnerability, but also let them do some of the heavy lifting. People say, you know, you got to go in the other room and get them to, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I think one of the things that we've got to say is, you know, but I'm, I'm here with you now. So let me work with you on what we have to work on here and let me work with them when I'm in there. How do you want to respond to what they've been saying so far? And, and just be a little bit more, I, I guess the word is really facilitative, but a bit of a catalyst where you're not putting so much of yourself into the equation. I think a lot of mediators feel like they have to be the superhero and save the day and, and that's exhausting. 
So I, I think it's, it's good to pay attention to how exhausted one is at the end of the day. Um, again, more so on Zoom for the reasons we talked about, but it might just be that, that it, it's easier for people to sit and just watch and nod as you are right now. Um, in person, we can call them out a little bit more. And I think we've got to use some more of that uh, the little yellow box that says, this is who's speaking right now. We need to get them having the yellow box around them a little more often. I love it. I love it. Let me shift over uh, to another topic. Uh, one of the things that a lot of mediators encounter, whether it's civil, commercial, family, personal injury, is emotion in mediations. Uh, you know, I'll have people say, oh, it's so nice to do business mediations because people aren't emotional in there. I'm like, well, I must have been in different mediations than you've been. <laughs> in person, there are ways that we can help people with their emotions. Mm -hmm. We can move them to another conference room. We can talk to them. We can hand them tissue, offer them a glass of water, you know, all those sorts of things and more. On an online mediation, how do we handle it when we're getting some sort of an emotional reaction to something? Maybe it's an emotional outburst, uh, whether it's a spectrum of, uh, of anger to, to sadness. Um, so the first question obviously is, are we in a joint session or a, a caucus or a private session? And uh, I, I think that division remains the same. Uh, we have to temper what we say and normalize that kind of a reaction when we're in a joint session much more so. Um, have to calm the spark so it doesn't start a wildfire in a joint session and we don't lose control. Um, and yet there are tools that we can use, like simply saying, so um, what I'm noticing is everybody's really upset right now. Um, either run to caucus, which is sometimes a, a valuable tool and sometimes a cop out. Um, or you know, we, we say something to sort of temper it, like saying, I can see this is just really, really important for all of you. And I want you to understand, we're gonna be here for several, several hours today. And our goal is to get through all of this. So, so talk them off the ledge a little bit with, um, with reminding them what we're here for, that they don't have to get it all out in the first half an hour, and that there's gonna be a lot of time for us to talk, for them to talk to me, for them to talk to each other, all that sort of thing. Um, and then I think in caucus, like you said, we can't hand them a tissue or a glass of water, but what we can say is, honestly, I wish you were sitting in the room here with me and I could hand you the box of tissues that's sitting here or pour you a glass of water. Why don't you take a minute, grab a tissue, grab a glass of water, we're in no hurry. Um, one thing I have noticed about these online mediations is that people seem to feel a faster pace. They seem to feel um, like they want to get to the finish line faster. I'm noticing that my online mediations take way less time than in-person mediations. When they're in person, um, it just feels like they can sit and argue and they have the energy to say, yeah, but, and then argue back all day long. And here online, I think because everybody's a little bit uncomfortable, and I, I think it actually works in our benefit. I've had greater success and more um, brief mediations because people are, are ready to get to the bottom of bottom line and get this over with. I haven't seen as much in emotional outbursts like you're talking about. And yet when they do, I think we all feel, those of us with strong empathy, we feel the same, like I can't reach out and do something for them. So we just have to do it verbally. And I think, again, meeting them where they're at and saying, I, I'd give anything if I could be sitting there next to you right now. I, I can't imagine how difficult this is that you're going through. And even though I'm not there in the room with you, I'm here, I'm here. This is a private space, just the two of us talking. We're in no hurry. Take your time, let's figure this out. We'll get to the bottom of it and give them the dose of optimism and the things that we would normally do if we were in the room with them. Um, but it really is, I, I, I'm also listening to what I'm saying and I'm noticing, and, and I'm sure you are too, Gene, knowing the, the, how sharp you are. I'm modulating my voice an awful lot as I'm doing these sort of one-liner role play things. And I think that becomes even more important that we have variety of, of how we use our voices, that we use pauses more, that we raise them and lower them more. 
and that we really demonstrate our empathy through our voices because it's it's half of what we have here the the non-visual half so i it, it, it does require more effort and, and more focus than we might be used to um but boy once once you get the hang of it and practice it for a while um and and i love that people are doing zoom happy hours and all those sorts of things now and and playing with the technology so they can get good at it and i i, I encourage people to do that because you'll start it, it, try it on your friends, right? You'll, you'll start to see if you crack a joke, how long is the delay until they laugh? Or what if they don't get it because they can't see your, your affect and your body language? It's, it's a really good learning experience. Um, but again, the importance of using your voice to keep it auditorily interesting for folks, it, I, I can't emphasize enough. Those are such great points. Great the, another thing that I was thinking about is as you were talking, I was, sort of simultaneously reflecting on what you're saying to us, is I, I wonder if one of the reasons why these mediations are going quicker is because people are having to do them in their house. And for a lot of people who have kids or pets or a significant other, it's kind of harsh to be, or it's hard to be mean when, <laughs> you know, when you're online with other people and your little kid comes up and says, why were you yelling at that person? Or why did that, what did that person do to make you sad? And so I wonder if that had, is sort of the, the home environment has something to do with this as well. It could, absolutely. Um, I, I, I'm thinking back to the mediations that I've had and um, too many times I've had just lawyers, insurance adjusters and that sort of thing. And when I've had the real parties and interest on the line, um, obviously you get different behavior from the lawyers to a certain extent. Um, but yeah, when everybody's working from home, I, you know, I, I think this goes for the, the lawyers too. It's hard for the lawyers to, you know, put on the armor and, um, and be tough advocates when they're sitting in their family's kitchen with their kids around it. it, 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 it I think our job is to be mindful of what those influences are on people and be watching for them. You know, you're sitting here right now, Gene, and you're not distracted, you're focused because you're sitting in your office and there aren't kids running around. And if you were at home, I gotta believe Jack would pass by or, or you know, something would happen that would uh, ground you a little bit. And I don't think that's altogether bad um, for people to feel a little more centered and grounded and give themselves less permission to, to be so effusive perhaps. Um, but I do think that, um, that part of our job is, is holding their interest and part of our job, like you've said, is managing those emotions when they're, um, when, they're, when they're feeling them, maybe with the understanding that you're adding to it, that they can't maintain that for as long at home as they might if they were in one of our conference rooms. And I think it also, it helps, it also helps us to see we're all human. You know, and, and for example, right now, you've got a beautiful painting behind you and a sculpture. And I've been in meetings and, and things where kids come up or the cat comes up and they hold the cat and it, it really helps to show that we have some sort of commonality if it's only to say we're all human and I, I think maybe it helps to like you said sort of soften the edges a lot and it does you know let me just say one more thing about that before we move on i think that we give our not we mediators but but people in general give themselves permission to act in the role they're in when they come into our mediations I've often thought that there are some lawyers in the way they practice that they should just have this metal plaque on their head that says defense lawyer or plaintiff's lawyer because they just assume the role, which may or may not be who they are as people. Um, and the same, you know, parties sometimes play the victim or, you know, the, the, the defiant defense uh, defendant who, who is in shock that they're being accused of such thing, you know, all of that. And it's a little bit like their character playing. They're playing to the role that they're in way too often when they're with us in person. And I think you're absolutely right. You're under a good point there, Gene, that it, it, this is the great equalizer to some extent because it does bring out the very human side of all of us. And my last question for you, Lee J. Uh, you know, I think you're a mind reader sometimes. I want to talk to you about equalization. I know a lot of mediators work very hard to have a nice in-person environment. And you go to the mediation, it's in a beautiful building or a restored home. You know, there's wonderful 
uh, food to be served and, and all those type of amenities. And we just don't get that now on Zoom. And I know that you've talked a lot and you've trained a lot of people on things like how to grow your mediation practice. In a Zoom online mediation environment for things like building height, the type of food that's being served, toys to play with during break sessions, all of those types of environmental things. For those things really don't exist like they once did, how do mediators kind of get a leg up on the competition, so to speak, so that they can make their online mediation experience something special? And people say, oh, I want to go back to Lee J or I want to go back to Gene uh, because the online experience was, was just amazing. So um, great question. And I think it's got three different parts. Um, as I find the, the, the first part is really more logistics and mechanics. Um, what I find is that the, the emails that I'm sending to people, they're not form letters on letterhead as much anymore. They're just emails and they're, they're trying to help people prepare for what to expect. And what I try to do is make them really comfortable in those notes with how it's gonna be, with how the, the breakout rooms are gonna work, um, with the confidentiality of the software and um, that it, there are going to be times where there, it's just them and me talking and um, just a casual conversation. And I'm, I'm conveying to them what I see as my competitive advantage in the style of mediation that I do uh, in advance and in writing uh, and on phone calls and everything else that we do in advance. Um, and by the way, another tip is um, I, I talked to a mediator the other day who, who said, well, of course, I do all my pre-mediation calls by Zoom now because mm -hmm. it gives us a chance to practice with the software, to get comfortable with it. And even if it's just with the lawyers, we all see each other, we get used to it. And when we come back together, they already know me. If they haven't worked with me before, they're familiar, they're comfortable. And I think that's brilliant. At, at taking advantage of the visual for the pre-mediation calls is um, is a real step in the right direction to make that first series of folks, whoever those pre-mediation meetings are with, are comfortable with you. I think the second piece of it is in person, and we talked about demonstrating the empathy, and the, the only thing I would add to that is, uh, before we're talking about what mediators are too exhausted at the end of a mediation, one of the things is, instead of um, working hard to not interrupt, instead, I like to think of it as just, allowing more of my curiosity out. I want, if somebody's doing as I am right now, a longer monologue and many paragraphs of, of text, I wanna hear what they are. I'm curious to see what they're gonna say next or where they're gonna go from here or why they raised that issue. And so I find I'm listening all the way to the end without interrupting even much more on Zoom than when I'm in person because I'm letting my curiosity out. There's not that kinetic energy back and forth that makes me wanna bounce back and forth with them really fast. I'm sitting more patiently and I want to see where they're taking that point and where they're going with it. Um, so like you said, listening can be hard, but if you're trying to listen, that's hard. If you're just curious and really seriously engaged in who they are and what they're saying, it's not that hard. Um, and then I think the third piece comes afterward and making sure that we're, um, we're making them comfortable toward the end when it gets more tense or they're getting more, uh, impatient or they're hungry or they need a bathroom break or you know any of those things um, we've really got to make sure that we don't get too business focused on the deal and the, the documenting of the deal or the negotiating of the the last you know twenty thousand dollars or the fine points of the terms because some mediators can uh, I've made the analogy before can be uh, like rental horses if you ever rented a horse to go up in the mountains or the beach or something and you hit that turnaround place and they now know they're headed back to the barn where food and water and rest and shade are and they take off like gangbusters just to get back to the barn and i think some mediators can be that way once they smell a deal like we're gonna get there we're gonna get there and then bam they're all about the deal and i think that's the place where especially in this environment we have to stay connected to people we can't be bouncing back and forth too fast between caucus rooms with numbers if if we're getting close um, we can literally undo everything we spent the first couple of hours doing and building um, by rushing through that part and depersonalizing it. Um, and I think that's the place where we don't want to slow the pace down too much, where they feel like we're dragging it on, but we do want to make them feel engaged personally with us 
all the way until the end, um, and then how we follow up afterwards. I, I think all of that experience is what sets us apart, and it's cheaper than a, a, a 40th floor high rise office space. Lee Jay, is there anything else that you'd like to leave us with today about online mediations and sort of the, to borrow as part of your language, the soft underbelly, I guess, of online mediations? Um, you know, I, two things, Gene. One, it, it's the old Maya Angelou quote that people won't remember what you said, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. And I think remembering not to get too transactional and to focus even more so in this environment on building relationship with every opportunity. Every time you come back into a caucus room, you, you have an opportunity to build a stronger and stronger relationship with those folks. And if you're focused on that, instead of how much and the deal and the terms and the facts and, and the law, if you can stay relationship focused, it'll help. And the second co co closing comment I've got, Gene, is I'm just so impressed with how you think about these things. And when you first reached out and said, there are a lot of people talking now about how to use Zoom effectively or you know whatever other software programs there are, I wanna talk about how to actually get to people and, and touch that soft human underbelly more effectively in this format. Nobody's talking about that yet. Uh, by the time some people view this video, it may be talked about by other folks, but Right now, as we sit here, nobody's asked that question but Eugene, and nobody has said, let's, let's explore this more and figure out how to do this better on that format. And uh, that's one of the things that I respect about you. Well, thank you, Lee Day. You know, I have much respect for you and uh, appreciate your time, which is so, so valuable in, in your thoughts and just your uh, humanness and your humanity, if I may say that. Just a pleasure, Gene. It's a nice conversation. It's always a pleasure. All right. Lee J, if people need to get in touch with you, how, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, it, Lee J at Lee J Berman com. L E E J A Y B E R M E N. Fantastic. All right. Thanks again, Lee J. You both good work, Gene.